Being a ministry wife is a role without a job description. And let's be honest, sometimes it seems like ministry might be easier if we did have one. If you are a ministry wife and are looking for hope, perspective, and a little bit of practical advice regarding your role, you're in the right place. Hi, I'm Christine Hoover, and I also am a pastor's wife. And I want to welcome you to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. Join me as we hear from women from various ministry contexts, having authentic conversations about our shared joys and challenges, even the ones we're unsure we can talk about out loud. No topic is off limits. Today, my guest is Amy Joseph. Amy has spent many years directing women's discipleship and ministry at Redeemer Presbyterian Church and Campus Outreach in San Diego. She and her husband are currently in the process of planting Center City Church in their neighborhood there in San Diego. She is also the author of Demystifying Decision Making, which we talk about in our conversation today. She helps us as ministry wives know what needs are ours to meet and what needs are not ours to meet. So here, friends, is my conversation with Amy Joseph. Hi, Amy. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so glad to have you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You guys are planting in San Diego, correct? That is correct. Yes. Yeah, so we have a, a newborn church in San Diego. We're probably, uh, we're like nine months in. <laughs> nine months. Oh my yeah. goodness. How is it going so far? It's It's been so sweet, honestly. Like it has been, we've had people tell us in the church planning process that, you know, there's a lot of planning and praying, but watching kind of these ideas on paper and prayers become a people, like an actual people, is their favorite part. And it has been precious. We were meeting in a backyard for a while, which is possible because we live in San Diego. Yeah. Um, but now we have like an actual building that we're renting and we just started uh, the nursery. So it's it's been really sweet to see God bring together people and a, and grow a family of God in, our, in really our neighborhood. I love that. And so what what do you kind of see as your role or your passion within the church plant? Yes, yes. Early on, I had I, I was one of those, I don't ever want to be a church planter's wife kind of women. And uh, the Lord said, ha ha, I heard that. Let's go. And I am not a great hospitality person. Like I, I enjoy making bringing people into our life, but I'm not a great like meal cooker for large groups of people. And that's not my capacity. So I actually really love, I help lead a team that does like a sermon, like sermon prep with the pastor. And so we kind of bring it together, some of our body and we do almost like a joint quiet time exegesis um, once a week. And I, I lead that time, which is really sweet and love that. And then I get to help think about spiritual formation for our people and um, which is really fun. So how do we form and disciple our women and and our little kids too? So it's been sweet. So not maybe the traditional, what you'd expect running the children's ministry maybe, or hosting a lot of people. I get really stressed hosting a lot of people. So we only do dessert or charcuterie. We don't do dinner with people. <laughs> My charcuterie knows is the me well. best. It's so easy. Charcuterie is great. So, but but all that to say, I really wrestle for for a while in ministry of feeling like I don't fit what I feel like is this phantom pastor's wife role. My gifts don't really fit that. How do I how do I fight that phantom wife of what I think I'm supposed to be and actually just walk in freedom of who God has actually made me to be and trust that He's going to provide for our flock through the body that He's provided for us. Thank you for giving voice to that because yeah. I think we all feel that at some level. Why do we have this idea? We all, if we all, every woman listening sat down and wrote out the job description of what they think they should be, it would probably be, we would probably all kind of say the same thing. But yet, none of us are, we're all so unique and different. And that's good. God made us that way. So how have you fought that, Amy? Yeah. I, well, I think one that the enemy loves loves to do that. I think there's a unique vulnerability in pastor's wives where I think the enemy gets in there and says, oh, here's this list of expectations and just kind of puts us under a, a hill of despondency of I'm never going to be enough. And when the gospel tells us we are not enough, I mean, that's what the gospel tells us. You do not have what it takes. John, you know, John 15, for apart from me, you can do nothing. That's, that's, that is not sound like good news, but that is incredibly freeing. Um, I think Ephesians, we talk a lot in our church about Ephesians um, 4, 12, and 13, the equipping the saints for the work of ministry. But we don't we don't like to, to do that because it 
what it tends to do in our hearts and our sinfully, we don't like to do that. Um, what it tends to do is it tends to to take the attention off of us and put it onto the body. And so I think that sinfully, we feel like, you know, in, in Mark 7, Jesus is healing all these people. And at one point, they, the crowd say, Jesus does all things well. And sinfully, what I want our flock to say about me is Amy does all things well. And that's that's my sin. My sin says I want I want you to look at me and think I'm impressive, and so I think some some of that is happening in the church body in our in our own in our hearts and our flesh, and then I think some of it is is a true right desire to want to serve our people and to want our people to have a good experience of Christ and the body, but we put all of that on ourselves rather than believing that God has given an an incredible multicolored kind of congregation to meet those needs and that we weren't expected to meet those needs and that we're, we're robbing from God's glory and from other people's gifts and opportunities when we try to take on all of those things ourselves. Uh-huh. That is so good and right. When you said that, I'm like, that is what has caused me to stumble in the past is my own desire to be seen and to be thought well of. Mm-hmm. And generally that means doing what I think people want me to do, not what God is asking me to do. Mm-hmm. So I think some people listening might be going, okay, I want to do that, but sometimes it's so hard to discern what God is calling me to do versus what maybe, you know, the mold says, or, you know, there's so many needs around me. And this is why I invited you on, Amy, because you've written a lot about how do we make decisions and discern what it is that we are called to do? What needs are we to meet. So you've written a book called Demystifying Decision Making. And I am so fascinated by this to apply this to pastor's wives because we are surrounded by needs all of the time. And I sometimes can get really overwhelmed with, okay, what is the need that I'm supposed to meet? And when is it okay for me to say, I'm not the one, Mm -hmm. I'm not the one to do it. And so you say, this is, this is the line that I love. I saw in an article you wrote, every need is not a call. So how do we discern when a need is a call and when it's not? Yes. And my husband jokes that I should have this tattooed on my arm. Um, He keeps saying to me, this wise woman wrote this article and it said (laughs) every need is not a call. He has to tell me this every week. So that's the joke. I wrote that, wrote that article and a lot of this book really out of my own, my own need to be reminded that we cannot do everything. I think first we have to remember that we are we are the cre- created ones. We are not the create creator, and you know all sin, all heresy starts when we flip those two. When we when we put the created things on the top, Romans one tells us. And so, just the idea that God has made us dignified derivatives. We are dignified. We have his image. We are significant because we are made in his image. We're the only thing of all creation that has has souls. We are a souled creation. And yet we're derivative. And that means that we we are not, we don't exist in and of ourselves. We are limited. We were created to be dependent on God and interdependent on each other before the fall. Before sin entered the world, we were made to be dependent on God and on each other. That is a good thing, not a bad thing. And our culture and our flesh and the enemy want us to be independent. Everything in our culture says be independent, meet all needs, be self-sufficient, be self-reliant, which is the very opposite of the gospel. And so I think just one, remembering that I'm I'm a created human being with limitations, and those limitations are not a result of the fall. (laughs) <laughs> they were there before the fall. God intended to me to be limited. He mm-hmm. intended me to be um, exhaustible, to need – God wired us to need actual sleep. Like what a uh-huh. gracious God he is. He gave us a body that needs between – if you're a newborn m- mom of a newborn, between three <laughs> and 12 hours of sleep. So I think remembering that, I think I have to go through every week in my heart, every week on my Sabbath time with the Lord, I sit down and I draw out this grid and it's just two circles – the inner circle, and they're concentric. So the inner circle says circle of responsibility. And then outside of that, it says circle of concern. And and I, I have to write down, what is my actual responsibility this week? Because t- sometimes they all get conflated in my mind. Everything right. feels like it is my responsibility. Right. So that newcomer to church, the lady who just had a baby, the high schooler who who's in my house, the, all of these people, they all become my responsibility. It feels like that. And so I have to go back to, okay, Lord, what is my actual responsibility? And so every week I write in there, my responsibility, I am called to be a, a faithful daughter of God. 
I am called to be a wife of G. Joe Joseph, a very specific man that you have called me to. I am called to be the mother of these three boys, a neighbor to this neighbor. And there's a few very specific things that I'm responsible for. The rest of the things in my life are in my circle of concern, not my circle of responsibility. And so it's helpful to kind of kick things out and be like, you don't belong here. Um, yes, maybe. Well, let's put that in the circle of concern. And then once I've got the things in this, the, the two circles, then I'm able to say, okay, now God, you know this week, you know what's coming. So I kind of almost like, I don't know if you guys, I have a giant purse, huge yeah. purse because I'm a mom. And so I have yeah. all the things. I have a Nerf bullet in there. I have a tennis yes, ball at all times. You never know what you can find in the purse, a race car, yeah. I think. And so when I clean out my purse, I just dump it out on the bed, right? And then I'm like, wow, look at all the things that found their way into my purse. So I feel like my Sabbath time every week is me dumping out my soul to the Lord and being like, look at all this stuff that found its way into my soul. Now, what actually belongs in my soul? And the rest of these things I'm giving to you. Like I don't need to carry the weight of that responsibility or that newcomer family or that complaining email that we got about our church. Or those are not things that I'm to carry. Um, And so I'm giving them to you. They are your responsibility responsibility, not mine. And so the circle of concern, circle of responsibility is really helpful. And then once I can look at the circle of concerns, I say, okay, in light of who you've made me to be, God, and in light of the week that you've got laid out before me, I I look at my calendar and I say, okay, what is this week? Oh, it's pretty wide open. Okay. We could have that family over for dinner or dessert or charcuterie, probably not dinner um, (laughs) because I've burned dinner. But, um, Or no, this week is crazy. My focus this week really is on my husband and my children. And so I probably don't have time to make that meal train. Um, But I do know three other people who love to cook that I can connect this. I could say, hey, so-and-so's new. And I think they could really use someone to, to get coffee with them. I'm booked up this week. Would you be interested in going on a hike with this woman? She's new. So it connecting them to the riches of the body rather than thinking I'm supposed to do it all myself because that just leads to me being depleted and then not doing the responsibility things that I am responsible for well. And so we have a line in our family who gets the best of and who gets the rest of. And so I'm constantly asking who is getting the best of me and my walk with God and who's getting the rest of of me and my walk with God. And oftentimes it's my husband and my children who are getting the rest of me and not the best of me. And when that happens, that's a red flag in our family. So we kind of go back to the drawing boards. Okay. What things have I said yes to that I need to go back and say, actually, in light of where my children are, I have three more years with these teenage boys before they go to college. The other line my husband tells me, all the time. He's he's the hero in this one. Is uh he says, "What can you do that no one else can do?" And that helps because there's a lot of people who can make a meal train. There's not a lot of people who can listen to my husband's sermon on Saturday night at ten o'clock at night. Right. I can do that. Right. They can't. And so he's do what you can do that only you can do. Only I can raise my children in this season. Um, only I can can love my husband well. Only I can make sure that I'm getting my time with the Lord. Other people can do the children's ministry next week, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not to say that there's not going to be times where God stretches us outside of our gifts and what feels natural, right? There mm-hmm. will be times when he does that, but he doesn't call us to live there. He, mm-hmm. he usually brings us back into the lane where we're kind of mm-hmm. most wired and comfortable. What you're describing requires us to really know God and know ourselves well. Yeah. And know our husbands well, know our kids well, what is needed. So I think that's the first step as you're talking. I'm like, well, first of all, Sabbath, you describe a Sabbath. Anyone listening who's not doing that, it's first step. Yeah. You got to have that time to pray and reflect and to think about the big picture, right? Yeah. But then also we have to really know ourselves. And I would say to a younger pastor's wife listening, this took me a while to kind of figure that out. Like, how am I designed by God personality-wise? How has he gifted me? What are my responsibilities? Even sometimes discerning what's in the responsibility circle can be a challenge. And at some point it becomes, you know, you know what those things are. So I would love for you to speak to that because you say that there are clues we can look to, to know what is our calling and what is not. So can you speak to that? The You say passions, priorities, and providential circumstances are important to, to consider. Yes, absolutely. So passions is is kind of the idea of, of how we're wired. How And, you know, we ask this question a lot. How do we refuel? What are the things that leave you with a full heart? 
and a full cup. So I know that one of my passions is not cooking because <laughs> it's really hard for me. I do it because I love my children. I want them to live and eat healthy food. Right. Um, but I don't walk away and go, oh my goodness, my heart is so full I cooked that. But when I read a good book to my children or when I go to the library and I fill up with a stack of, of, of age-appropriate, exciting, challenging novels to feed them, I, I get really excited. I really care about what I feed their minds, right? So I've learned that over time. Um, so what are your passions? And, and one of the things that we talk about when we think about giftedness and the way you're wired is is three E's. So enjoyment. What do I enjoy? Like what would I do if no one told me I had to do it? Mm -hmm. I would write and I would read if no one told me I had to do it. No one was looking. My friend, she would connect deeply with people and ask incredible questions to a wall if she was left in a room by herself (laughs) because she's just made to do it. So what do I enjoy? So E, what am I efficient at? Like, what am I efficient at? I am. I can make a meal and do a birthday party. I can. I have the ability, but I am wildly inefficient. It it stresses me out for like a month to plan a birthday party, and then I'm tired for like two weeks, right? So I can do it, but I'm not efficient at it. Whereas I have friends who can do that on the backstroke, right? So what are you and what do you enjoy? What are you efficient at? And, and what are you effective at? Effective means you do it and you do it well. And people come up to you later and say, hey, you do this and you don't even realize you do this naturally, but you are so welcoming. Or people come up to someone else at church and say, every meal you make is so tasty and warm and comfortable. And and when we come into your house, it feels like we're sitting at God's table. It's just, mm. right, that's the gift of hospitality. And so I would look for those three E's in your life to help figure out, well, what are your passions? What are the things that you get that get you excited about or get you really frustrated? What are the things that break your heart? Maybe for the kingdom of God or for the, the world around you. Those are probably some of your passions. And then it's not just passions though. And unfortunately, our culture would have us think if you love it, you should do it. But we also have priorities. And so I would love to just read books all day, but my children need food <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and they need a mama who can go hiking with them or whatever the thing is. And so you have to look at your priorities in this season. And this changes, friends. This changes based on what season of life we're in. So when my kids were in that baby young season, my days were completely I couldn't plan anything. You didn't know when you could leave the house. You didn't know when you're going to go to the grocery store. But now my kids are all in school. And so, you know, between 10 and 2, I can have coffee with women. I can go on walks with women. Those were things I did once a month, you know, when my kids were little. But now I have a season for that. So you look at your priorities in this season. We're in a church planting season. That's a really different season than maybe an established church season. Yeah. And so you ask, what are my priorities? What are my passions? And then what are my priorities in this season? And then what are the providential circumstances that God has put me in? So if God has given you um, a, a tendency towards anxiety and depression, and you have a really small capacity in this season, that might not be forever, right? If you have a small capacity in this season, you have to take that into consideration. Like, okay, well, what is actually going to help me walk with God and help my family walk with God. Um, And in this season, if my capacity is smaller, that's going to shape the way I make decisions about what I do at church or what I do in my neighborhood. Um, So, or if you have a child with special needs, right? That's a providential circumstance that God has given you. And and you, you respect that as something that God has given you. And you say, in light of this, this changes the way I think about the way I spend my time. And we trust that. I say they're providential because we don't believe in just fate. We don't believe they just happen. We believe that the God of the universe has hand-selected these specific set of circumstances for us and has something good to give us in them, um, has something good for us and for others involved because of those things. And so I think it's really important to, to respect, you know, Psalm 16, the Lord is my portion and my cup. He has assigned for me boundary lines in pleasant places. I have a delightful inheritance. He's put me within these present boundary lines and circumstances for good purpose. And I do well to respect them mm-hmm. <laughs> because the God of the universe has ordered them. Mm-hmm. So now how do I live within them? That's really good. And I will say I have not done this well in the past. That there have been times where I have not liked my circumstances. Oh. I have not liked my boundaries. Mm-hmm. And I think especially when my kids were young and I really couldn't do anything, I've always loved being a part of what my husband was doing. Mm-hmm. And to have that limitation felt bad. It mm-hmm. didn't feel good. But I love that you're giving you're giving voice to that, that it, we – embracing this as God's goodness to us is so important. And those seasons will change. 
I, at the time, I thought it would never change, but they do. And you do have more capacity later. So I'd love to kind of bring this home to different scenarios that we face as pastor's wives, how we can make decisions or how you make these decisions. So these are scenarios that I came up with that have happened to me where I struggle to kind of make decisions. One is that my husband might come home and mention in passing that someone in the church is really hurting. Mm. And it's someone I know um, and I, I really care about them. And so my first instinct is I want to jump into that situation. I want to help in some way. What counsel would you give me about this type of situation, Amy? Yes, because every need is not a call. So we feel that and we go, oh, I I must do something. I must do something. And so I think the first thing is to slow down a little bit and to just to to say, okay, I've just been given this information. Now, what am I to do with it? And, And honestly, this sounds so like we should know this. But I would start by praying. Like we often think, oh, this person needs a meal or this person needs me to walk with them or this person needs wisdom. When the first thing this person needs is me to actually bring them into the presence of God. Mm. And so the thought of just picking up that care or that information and bringing it into the presence of God and saying, God, I've just received this information. And instead of immediately, it's kind of selfish to immediately go, what am I supposed to do? Rather than to sit in the moment and go, goodness, how does it feel to be that person in this situation right now? You love so and so, you know. You love Sally. You you know her. You knew this day before it before, you know, time was was wound up. And so, what Lord, what are you doing in Sally's life? What are you trying to do in Sally's life? And how can I come alongside that within who you've called me to be? And how can I set Sally before the presence of God and in the presence of our body so that she can be cared for well? Rather than starting with, what am I to do? Do you see the difference? One is yes. very God-centered. God, you you know this person. And so the, the onus is on God then to, to help us see. And he loves to do that. What's my role? And then I would ask questions like, within who I am. So for me, I love to write notes. So I would think, I immediately think I would, I want to write her a note. That's something that I can do within who I am, within my capacity at home. I can write her a note that says, Hey, this is a scripture I'm praying for you. And I really care about you. And I would probably, I would probably text our elders wives and say, Hey, so-and-so is in a really hard spot. Does anyone have a chance to reach out, bring a meal, go on a walk, you know, in light of who you are, I think so-and-so, you're so good at just being present. Do you think you can go by and sit with her at the carpool line next week? Or So help involve the body of Christ um, as you as you see fit. But, but I think, yeah, it, the first start has to be taking it off of what am I to do and bringing it to God and saying, God, you know what this person needs. Now, Holy Spirit, press into me if there's something I'm going to do. And it might be hard. It might be, Amy, you need to make the meal. And, and if God is telling me to make the meal, I'm going to make the meal because I want to obey God. And I think putting it back on obedience to Christ. So even if saying no is obedience to Christ, that helps me to say, mm-hmm. no, I'm, I'm being disobedient if I say yes to this when God has not told me to do this because yes. my children need me this week and I can't. I that can't. Is a, that's a very important distinction. And it's helped me too to think about that. If God has not asked me to do this, then I'm going on my own, outside mm-hmm. of what he's directed me to do, to try to be a, a functional savior, basically, to yeah. this person. Versus, Lord, y- you get the glory. Jesus does all things well. What small part do I play to come alongside of the work you're already doing in this person's life? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about, and I love that you're highlighting this interdependence in the body. That's mm-hmm. so important. What about if a another elder's wife comes to you and says, there's mm. this need, will you meet it? I mean, she's looking to you inter- interdependently. And yeah, I know you can say no, but does that does that put pressure or Yeah, oh totally. And I I say I'm saying all these things so strongly because I live I feel like I, I this is my every week. I'm like, "No, no, no, don't need to do that." There's a whole inner dialogue going on. <laughs> I um I think one of my mentors back in South Carolina, she told us early on um that our no's are training, our people are discipling our people, and that when we say no to something that we know God has called us not to do, we are modeling for our people the best thing. So when I say no to something on the sa- my Sabbath time, even though it's really hard for me to say, no, we're not coming to that birthday party because that's when I that's when I have my time with Jesus every every week, and I've had that for the past 
15 or 16 years. That is a time I don't interrupt. I feel terrible every time. And and yet I am modeling for them healthy boundaries. And I'm saying, no, that nothing comes in between my, my time with Jesus. Because if I don't have that, the whole thing goes to pot. Everything's yes. falling apart. Yes. And so we model with our yeses and our noes. And then I also think that um, Stephen Covey talks about the tyranny of the urgent. And so in the moment, something feels incredibly urgent. And the urgent often steals us from the important. And so when something comes in and it feels urgent in that moment, it's okay to say, you know what, that is a, you know, to the elder's wife or whatever, that is really, that is really good to know. I'm going to put that person at the very top of my list. And so in the next three weeks, I will reach out to her. And to feel like that, I mean, obviously, if someone is dying, there's an, an urgency right, that right, is right. a true urgency. We should we should go more than three weeks. But a lot of times, like I disciple women and they'll say, Amy, I, I hate it that you tell me, sure, can we get something on the schedule next month? But I love it that you tell me that because you show me that it's okay to say, I can't do that this week and I can't do that next week, but I would love to do that in three weeks. Mm. And I'd love to go on a walk with you. And until then, I'll be praying for you faithfully. I really will. And you can text me. And we'll talk about so respecting time, like we are time bound creatures, and God is outside of time, and so it's okay to not schedule something in the next twenty minutes um, with somebody <laughs> because and this is right. the because it feels like in that moment this is what we need to do right now. Um, and, and my, you know, what we talk a lot about in this season of life in our family is being a paced presence, right? I want to be a paced presence in the lives of our people. Not just for the next six months, a big, you know, shooting star right. blur that burns out. Right. I want to be here in 10 years, yes. faithfully, faithfully loving this family and this flock. And if I'm going to be doing that, that's going to require me to be paced and present, both of those. And so in some seasons, I'm I'm more paced than I am present <laughs> and I need to be pressed. I need to be pressed in my boundaries a little bit and, and stretched. In other seasons, I'm more, I'm more present than I am paced. I'm, I'm all here but I'm falling apart inside and I'm not going to last very long. <laughs> yes. So that question of what is going to what is going to help me and them be a paced presence for the next 6 months rather than the next 6 minutes. <laughs> and I just that urgency, I, I don't think that comes from the, Now there will be times when God presses something in our hearts and it's a compulsion like I must do this. I must go to the store and buy this food for this person and bring it by their house. You obey that. You yes. obey that because that's the Holy Spirit pressing or I must write this person or I've got to call this person tonight at 11 o'clock at night and check on them. You know the difference between when it's a Holy Spirit, yeah. the Lord is pushing me to do this. And when it's a frantic, a meeting needs, pressure. Um, and I think the difference is we have to be still enough. Like you said, we have to have some time with the Lord. And for young mamas, I always say, my Sabbath time is my feast. If you feast once a week, you can nibble throughout the week. You know, your quiet time gets interrupted because someone has to go poo-poo or, you know, someone throws up or you have right. to, you know, whatever right, happens, right. The, the school calls and so-and-so forgot their lunchbox or, you know, whatever it is, you can nibble because you feasted. And so find that. So when is that time that you get to feast with God and his word? And that frees you during the week. If you have to nibble, you can nibble because you already ate a great juicy uh-huh. steak on Sunday. And so you can have goldfish <laughs> from the word if you need to. Uh-huh. So helpful, Amy. Okay, I have another scenario. Let's say we've said yes to something that we probably shouldn't have said yes to, and we realize it really quickly that we should have said no. What do What do you do? Uh, I beat myself up first, <laughs> if I'm honest with you, and I go, "Oh man, I can't believe I just did that." And then, and then I probably go and spend a little time with the Lord. And say, Lord, I did it again because I do this a lot. I really want <laughs> to please. Too. I really want to please people, and that's one of my. I actually wrote down to, to share Galatians one ten. For oh, I am I now, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Mm-hmm. As I think a lot of times, um, pastors' wives, we really do, and some of it's a right desire to want to please them, but God is the only one who can perfectly please them, not me. Um, so I think I'd first have to confess to the Lord and say, Lord, I've done it again and receive his forgiveness and not beat myself up because the Lord doesn't turn around and say, oh, you did it again. He lets me run to him and sit on his lap. And he said, I know, I know we're getting there. We're changing <laughs> day by day. We're growing. It's okay. We're going to do this. And then I think I'd have to eat my humble pie and go to the person and say, can I be honest with you? 
I really, in that moment, I really wanted to please you and I really wanted to meet that need. And I've gone back and I've thought and I've prayed about it and it's really not best. And I know it and I'm sorry. And that's victory. If you do that, you have just modeled the gospel for your people. You have just showed them what to do when we mess up and we mess up constantly. Martin Luther said in his first of the 95 Theses, when we say that Christianity is repentance, we mean that all of life is repentance. We are constantly repenting. And so we're teaching our people how to repent. And then I think I would see, you know, depending on what it is, if it was a, I've done this where I've said, yes, I can come speak at that event. And then, because I was excited and it sounded fun and I was going to get to travel. And then I look at the calendar and I'm like, oh, that's a crazy weekend. We can't do that. So I would, if I've made a very big mistake uh, and that can't be fixed in the sense of like, there's not some, I can help try to help f- find someone else to meet the need that I said I could meet and do do the work myself. Like say, I'm going to reach out to a few friends that I know are also speakers. Maybe they can do this retreat. And if they can't, I will absolutely come. And, and I will trust the Lord with this mistake that he is sovereign. But if it's a small thing that I can fix, I would actually, I would back out and say, I, I, have, I have overcommitted and I am sorry. Um, I'm so sorry to do that, but I really need to honor God and I need to listen to his voice and to trust the Lord that he's going to take care of this situation. And I will help you try to fix it if I can, or I will point you to other people who might be able to fulfill that need. But, um, but yeah, that putting it in obedience to Christ, like to obey Christ right now is to say, no, I can't do that. Or yes, mm-hmm. I will do that. And I will do that with his strength. And there've been yes. plenty of times where our weeks, I look at our week and I just, honestly, I sit down on my sun- Sunday and I cry and I'm like, I don't think we're going to be, I don't think we can do that this week. This is too much. And my husband will say, God will give us what we need. We're going to take it day by day. And I'll tell you what, we get through the week and I'm like, I'm not even tired because God sustained us because he walked us through. And so I have this image of every week when I do my calendar with my husband, we have a calendaring time too, which really Me helps too. to yes. hear what is, what DJ, what's your priority for this week and how can I help you with your priority? That helps me set my priorities. Yes. But after we do our, our calendar time, I have this image of just walking with Jesus, holding my hand through every day of the week and going, you're going to walk us through this week. And, and some of these plans are going to change and that's okay. And things are going to get added and things are going to get subtracted. But you know what's coming this week. And so I, I'm doing this with your strength this week. And that makes me actually go from fear about the week to excitement about the oh. week. That's like really you're going to give me strength. If, if Augustine said, command whatever you will, but give all that you command. Command mm. us to do whatever you will, Lord, but you have to give us everything we need to do that to do what you've commanded. And I love that because it puts the onus back on God, who is inexhaustible, unlimited, all-powerful, outside of time, all-wise. And that if he's called me to this, he's going to give us what we need. And the world doesn't understand that. The world doesn't have a category for self, self-giving, self sacrificial love that actually leaves us full. Yes, but yes, the yes. The scriptures have a category for that. So, because yeah. I think sometimes in the whole self, self-help self or the self-care movement, which there's some really good things there, but it, they, there's no category for self-sacrificial love and the Holy Spirit's empowering. They have no concept of that because they don't know God. We do. We know that God can give us strength that is not ours and it can well up and we can have energy and leave a full week and still be full because we obeyed. So I I would put the onus back on what is God calling me to do and then trusting him to obey it, whether that's a yes or whether that's a hard no. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about the no. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes we don't say no because we don't know how. We don't mm-hmm. have the language and we feel almost like it's ungodly to say no, which we, we've we already debunked that. That's not true. But but I wasn't taught to say no. And so I, I struggled, to, even though I would know it was a no, I didn't know how to say it in a way that felt gracious. So can you give us that language? Yes. Well, first I would say Jesus said no. Jesus had a lot of no's. And so um, Jesus did not meet every need um, when he was on this earth. And that's Jesus himself. He would pull away, Mark 1, and to a quiet place, and he would pray. He did not heal every person. But he always walked in obedience to the Father. He never disobeyed the Father. And he always walked in the Father's strength. So there is freedom to say no. Jesus himself said no. Um, I think first I would – I tell people when someone asks you to do something or invites you into a need, it's kind of like receiving a Lennox bowl, like a really fancy bowl. So the first thing you do when someone hands you something like that is you receive it and you thank them. So you say, 
oh my goodness, thank you so much for telling me that or for inviting me into that or for sharing that need with me. I, I'm so honored that you would feel safe enough with me to ask me about that. I, I, I see this and I appreciate it and I value it and I validate that it's real, whatever the need is, right? You need a babysitter. Thank you for thinking of me. I, you know I love your children and I would love to do that. I can't do that this week. And then I tried to explain a little bit of my heart, you know, this week, and we don't owe someone an excuse. So this isn't like a plead an excuse and let them into your whole schedule, but it is a, man, I would love to do that. I can't this week, but please keep asking me because there will be a time when I can, and I would be delighted to watch your children, for example, um, or I think connecting it back to God, but, or saying no, but I will, I will help think of someone who might be able to meet that mm-hmm. need or I really will be praying about that need that you've brought to me. And I really want to hear, I'm going to check back in with you in a week and see, we know what God's done and if he's provided. Mm -hmm. Um, And keep me on the short list. If there's like an emergency and you can find no one, I can cancel that meeting if I had to, if there was, you know. So I, I think there's ways to say, thank you for thinking of me. I cannot. Here is one short reason why I cannot. Um, and please ask me again because I'd really love to. And can I help you in any way try to meet that need? Mm. Um, I, I, when people do that to me, I know it's hard. And, and honestly, when people say no to me, I actually thank them now yes. because I know how hard it is. Yes. Like, thank you for being honest. Thank you for telling me that you cannot do that. I know God will provide. I appreciate it. <laughs> Honoring the no. Honoring yes, the no. It's so hard. It's so hard uh-huh. to do. Uh-huh. But I love that you – you brought this up earlier, and this is how I think of it too, is we're discipling people in the ways that we do this, through the way we handle our schedule, through the mm-hmm. way that we are present when we are there, the way we say no, the way we respond to their no. Like in a busy world where people are overextended and anxious, mm-hmm. for us to be able to live a peaceful life, yes, a fully engaged where God has us, but also resting and saying no, that is a sermon we preach every time we have these interactions. So thank you for for bringing that up. And there's so much more I want to ask you, but I think what we just need to say is everyone go get this book because clearly <laughs> you have thought so much about this and it will be helpful for, for us in our ministry. So the book again is called Demystifying Decision Making. So thank you, Amy, for joining me today and all of these wonderful insights. It's been such a joy. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to the Ministry Wives podcast, a production of the North American Mission Board. If you found this content helpful, please subscribe, rate, and review us on your podcast platform or share it with a friend. You can find this podcast and other helpful resources at ministrywivespodcast.com.